everyone. My name is Emily. I head up a team at Google called Food for Good. I am so excited today to bring Mike Evans to talks at Google. Mike Evans is the founder of Grubhub, from which I ordered Chinese food from last night. Many of you might know Grubhub, having ordered from them. Uh, he's also one of the very few individuals uh, that I've known who has actually ridden across the country, coast to coast, east to west. That's like over 4,000 miles. Uh, he has a recumbent bicycle named Persephone that we might talk about during this talk. And now he is an author of a memoir called Hangry, which I highly recommend. I'm currently slightly hangry because it is lunchtime. So with that, I want to welcome Mike Evans to Talks at Google. Hey, thanks for having me. Let me start with a very, very easy and fun first question, though it could also be very hard depending on who your friends are in Chicago. Uh, you started, you got your start with Grubhub uh, by going to all these restaurants in Chicago and eating pizza. So what is your current today most favorite Chicago pizza restaurant? So Chicago style pizza, I would say JB Alberto's for a New York style pizza. Um, you can get some good stuff at Kalo for Detroit style pizza. I like Jets. Uh, I don't think pizza is one cuisine. I think it's like 15 cuisines. So uh, there's there's a, a pizza for every mood. So I have to ask, is the Detroit pizza the, the square one? The yeah, weird it's the square one in the pan. That's right. right. Got it. Got it. Very cool. Very cool. Well, let's dive in a little bit. Um, let's start with your origin story. I know you grew up... Um, at, with a single mother, right? Your mother was, you know, had a you know long journey to bring you up in Georgia and some pretty humble beginnings. So um, before even your first job coming out of MIT at Classified Ventures, did you have any inkling that you were an entrepreneur? Yeah, I think, um, you know, coming out of school, I had a bunch of school debt. My my wife, and uh, who, I, who I had just recently married, um, had a bunch of school debt. And I didn't want to be in debt forever. Mm -hmm. And um, it actually turns out probably the best possible plan to not be in debt is to just be a software engineer and take a good salary and pay off your debt. That is not the plan that I executed. What I did instead is I quit that good paying job and, and started a company. But there was another thing there too, which was um, I just didn't like people telling me what to do. Uh, mm -hmm. And I decided to turn that from a liability into an asset by being the boss. Uh, and so that's, I kind of knew I was going to do something and I was hunting around for an idea for pretty much the whole time I was at, uh, at Classified Ventures after finishing my degree. You were pretty bored at Classified Ventures. Like, what was that? Like, what was going on? Like, how did you end up in cl at Classified Ventures in the first place? Yeah, my wife went to Northwestern Law and so I moved to Chicago. There weren't, this was right after the dot-com crash. So this was like 2000, uh, late 2000, early 2001. And there just weren't that many tech jobs. And so I, I got two offers coming out of school. Uh, one was at, in Chicago anyway, one was at Classified Ventures, which was homefinder.com and apartments.com. Uh, and the other one was at a steel mill in Gary, Indiana. And I actually kind of wanted to do the steel mill job, but the <laughs> software job paid twice as much. And I was like, well, I got all this debt, so I got to do it. And the company was a really weird company because it was born of like four or five different newspaper conglomerates as an answer to this new internet thing that was starting mm -hmm. to take a bite out of their classified revenues. And so all of the, you know, cars.com and auction.com and homefinder.com, they were, there was just a bunch of different verticals that were all supposed to uh, re like shore up the revenues of lost classified um, ads. Yeah, it was an interesting situation, but I'll leave those of you who haven't read his book yet um, to find out uh, what exactly was going on behind the scenes. Uh, you know, it's interesting as you were sort of getting Grubhub going, you know, after work in the middle of, you know, the late nights that you had. Um, you know, there's this one theme that kept coming up for me. Uh, it, you there, there are no silver bullets, right? Like it was just like good hard work that you had to put in to, to get stuff done. And, um, you know, you walk the streets of many cities in the early days to just like pick up paper menus and scan them in. You also tried a lot of things. Like you were sort of relentless and just persisting. Like I I, I love the story about you buying, it seemed like 10,000 pounds of fridge magnets. Like, yeah. could you tell us a little bit about like uh, sort of your approach to entrepreneurship and then how then you like express this to, you know, your, your, you know, and, well, I know you didn't have investors until later on, but like, I find sometimes like, you know, our, our managers and our investors want like speed and scale and novel, but like, sometimes it's just hard work. There's no silver bullet. So, so how do you approach this? Yeah, I think the key with 
innovation, which is at the heart of starting a business, is that it's it it doesn't help to be first necessarily, mm -hmm. which um, Excite and Lycos might tell you at Google, right? Uh, you have to be first best, and you don't get there by thinking about scaling first. You get there by iterating on a product and making the product really good. Yeah. So. Um, so I, I was able to get out in front and have one of the earlier online ordering platforms. It wasn't the first one. Uh, Domino's Pizza had done one prior to what I had done. But, you know, by way of example, when I first created the business, I was just trying to get all the restaurants that delivered to my address along with their menus. But turning an address into a latitude longitude was like really hard. Like you, Google Maps didn't exist yet. Like there was no API that I could use. And so I literally <laughs> downloaded the census data from the U.S. government and created my own API to turn... Uh, turn addresses into lat longs and like maybe I should have made Google Google Maps like maybe that would have been a better business I'm not really sure but there this is what this is what it was like like a little bit earlier on is that you had to sort of create foundational pieces and then if you did it gave you an advantage in terms of being able to iterate earlier so by the time more competition started showing up I was on my fifth or sixth or seventh version mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I would say that um, all competitive differentiators go away over time. And simply being big is not a competitive differentiator. The only uh, the only consistent competitive differentiator that's durable is a, a culture of innovation and mm -hmm. being able to create things. And that's messy. It's not fast and scalable. Yeah. Tell us about your fridge magnet experiment because I think that one was so interesting in that um, you thought about it, you didn't think too hard and you kind of got all the fridge magnets, but it wasn't necessarily your most spectacular success. Like you, you had a couple of- instances. Yeah, <laughs> I, I had some uh, I had some dead ends as I was sort of trying to create this thing. Um, one of them, you know, I was trying to get more customers. I was trying to get more more demand. I had had a lot of success with search engine optimization for like uh, on, on MSN and Yahoo and this new search engine Google that had just started up. I was doing pretty well there. But I wanted to get like more advertising. And I thought, well, when people are hungry, they go to their fridge. And uh, and so maybe I'll just get fridge magnets. They were like, they were crazy cheap. They were three cents each. I did not realize that $3,000 worth of fridge magnets would be 10. It was like over 10,000 pounds. It was like, it was like four and a half, actually a little less. It was like four and a half tons. And I had like a walk up apartment. And so when the semi truck showed up with like all these magnets, I was like, oh, Christ. <laughs> haul them all up the stairs and then distribute them around the outside of my apartment so that like the floor didn't cave in. Um, and then, and then I had to get rid of them. Then I had to actually distribute them. And that was a pain in the neck because I couldn't hire people to do it. So they were too dang heavy. And so I would just take like a hundred with them, hundred of them with me every day. And I would just leave them on things, uh, which I guess is probably littering, but like, <laughs> I, like I was just trying to get the word out. And so I would do like a hundred of them a day and on cars and on mailboxes and various things like that. Oh my God, it's crazy. You know, um, on on the same note, I I thought your story about dragging some of your friends along to walk cities was pretty bold, right? You know, like after you know raining in San Francisco, walking all the hills, like you were a very persistent person and just getting stuff done, right? And you didn't think too hard about it. Like, is is that is that still a rule of thumb for you? Is to just get going rather than to overthink things? Yeah, I think starting is important. I think um, it's the most important thing you can do. It's 51% of success. Everything else is optimization. And uh, it's an important 49% though. Like, I, you know, I started out, I walked all of San Francisco. I picked up every menu in the city. And um, I'm sorry, in the Bay Area, not just in San Francisco. I walked a lot of those hills. I was in great shape by the time I picked up all those menus. Um, nowadays, you use user-generated content, right? So yeah. I opt, like, obviously I did that the first time, but I optimized, right? That's not actually, actually all that great a use of my time when I'm, when I have employees and I have salespeople and I'm trying to do marketing and things like that. So there's this idea of like, start and then iterate and optimize. And uh, it's been written about, there's a book called uh, The Lean Startup Circle by Eric Reese. He wrote about it, but the first person who had ever, ever sort of taught me about this idea was Dr. Bo's from Bo speakers who, who taught oh, acoustics at MIT and his last class, like it wasn't about speakers. It was about um, how to run a business. And he talked about the, the middling, like, or kind of poor commercial success his first speaker had. And his mm -hmm. big innovation was let's point the speakers away from the listener and make it sound like a concert hall. Mm -hmm. And 
people didn't buy it. Like it might've been technically a good product, but people didn't buy it. And so, you know, the advice I sort of paraphrase from that class is don't make a perfect speaker, make a bad speaker and then make it better. And so walking the city of San Francisco was, was helpful in terms of getting customers, getting diners to show up on the website so that I could then sell online ordering. But I didn't, I didn't walk the next 15 cities. I came up with like a better way. And so there's, there's the start idea, but there's also like you, you like work smart too. like start working towards optimization. <laughs> you start, but over time get better at, you yeah. know, doing that job. Uh, you know, let's dive into that a little bit further, actually. Uh, you know, customers are super important to you. You're like, make a thing, sell a customer. Uh, I, I actually, you know, loved what you said about like, you know, going to like borders, buying, you know, selling for dummies. Um, I found it very interesting because, you know, I, I'm an engineer as well, I'm a mechanical engineer. Uh, and and my favorite time was when I was just like left alone in my lab, right, to just like build uh, like robots, didn't have to talk to anyone, didn't have to look anyone in the eye. Like a lot of engineers, like, okay, do you know the difference between an extroverted engineer and an introverted engineer? I don't. What is it? So an extroverted engineer will look at your shoes while they're talking to you versus their own shoes. Huh. So I am an extroverted engineer now, but how did you even like find your way to selling a customer? Like, like I, I, maybe you were born extroverted, like, but you went into engineering. So you have this like really cool combination. Like what advice do you have in like engineers who build things but are like a little nervous about like going and communicating what they have? Yeah, I well, first I want to say that um, it, that it's okay to be an engineer and an extrovert, and that like it takes all kinds, and that, that there's a variety of personalities in any in any uh, discipline. Um, and then the other thing I'd say is rejection sucks for everyone. It mm -hmm. rejection like getting thrown out of a restaurant sucked for me, and it sucks for everybody. And um, it it's it's I I sort of have a process for dealing. I have a, a way I deal with rejection, and, and it is. Um, first of all, recognize that it stinks and like feel, feel the crappiness. Like don't try to pretend like it doesn't stink because you can only pretend so long. Yeah. And so feeling though that the, the grief and frustration and anger and humiliation of getting like physically thrown out of a restaurant was part of my process. Like this yeah. stinks. I we're going through the back door half the time. Yeah, I mean, I would literally walk in through the alleyway and sometimes you get yelled at when you do that. Um, <laughs> But the other thing was that uh, I would I would walk into let's call it eight restaurants in, in an afternoon, and I would do that regardless of whether I sold the first seven or I got zero out of the first seven. Mm -hmm. Sales is a discipline, not not a charismatic, motivational, like denying. You know, it's not just hard work. Good sales is about discipline and good like approaching that rejection was I'm going to talk to eight restaurants regardless of how much success I had yesterday, regardless of how much success I have today, regardless of how much I have tomorrow. And I'm going to work that system so that I don't have to think about it too much. I don't like, I don't have to like, you know, get myself all geared up to like go walk into a restaurant. It didn't work all the time. I mean that, that I'm talking about an aspirational ideal. There were certainly Fridays where I was like, I'm playing Xbox. This sucks. I'm not going to go sell a restaurant. Uh, exactly. Or I would code instead. Um, and this was one of the learnings I learned in the book is that um, sometimes working through the human element and working as a manager and mm -hmm. being a leader, um, I, like I like there was a, there was a day I remember in particular where I where I coded for eight hours. I was working on some customer service software. Yeah. And like at the end of the day, I was like, man, that was a great day. And then I was like, but was it? Did I really accomplish what I was supposed to be accomplishing today? Or should I have like worked through the challenges in our HR policies for customer service hourly workers? Oh my God, I don't want to do that. <laughs> like, but it's but it's important. It's important to, to be disciplined about doing the things, yeah. it, doing the things that that uh, not just doing the things that were easy. That's right. That's right. Or not just doing the things that we love doing, uh, and also doing the suite of things that have impact on the on the broader business and the broader organization. You know, on that note, I I know that. As Grubhub scaled pretty quickly at, at a few points, uh, you brought on Matt. You brought on you know Matt, who was working with you at Classified, um, and then you know at one at a time you started hiring more and more people. And at one point, um, you know you you were no longer coding; like you, you were actually locked out of the system at one point, right? Yeah, it was a <laughs> it was a violent change. Uh, it was not of my own volition. Um, 
and I talk about this in Hangry. I talk about it in the book that there was one evening where I, it was like a end of a long day at work. And I was like, Hey, can we just add this one feature? And I, I had actually been the one who put in the process that says, no, like you can't like any given manager can't just come up to you and tell you to add a feature. Like there's a, there's a prioritization process and the like just one thing is it's like the bane of the engineers, the software developers existence. It's the worst. And so, but then I did it. I was like, let's add this feature. And the feature was um, tips. I wanted to change the default tip amounts because, because, and there's a, there's a whole story leading up to this in the book, but you know, the punchline of it is that um, we were finding out that we were signing up restaurants faster when tips, when, when drivers got bigger tips. And so we were like, well, let's suggest higher tips. By the way, that is why the tips are what they're suggested. They're not based on some like social norms. It was just like, oh, if we get more tips for the drivers, we'll we'll sign up more restaurants. So let's just like suggest it and see what happens. So I changed it in production. I logged on the production servers and I changed the numbers. It's like one number on an HTML page. It's like, it, it, it's not even like a big deal, right? Uh, the head engineer did not agree. <laughs> with that sentiment. And so they locked me out of the source control the, the <laughs> next morning when I got to work. I was still sweaty after biking to work and found out that I had been locked out of like all the systems. So I could I could still check code into source control. I had been locked out of like root access on the servers. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a tough moment because the the my coworker Mike, he was he was right. And um but he didn't necessarily say it in like the way you usually talk to a boss, but also it, you say it the way you, you talk to somebody who's making your life harder. Yeah. And I had sort of tried to create this egalitarian uh, community where we were coworkers, not, in, you know, some employees and bosses. And it's so like, I had to sort of put my money where my mouth was and like not fly off the handle in the moment. Yeah. It was one of the hardest things I've ever done to like, just take a walk yeah. instead of being like, <laughs> this is not the way this is supposed to go. <laughs> But it was actually a great change. I, I, I then no longer was writing software and I was instead, um, and I was instead removing obstacles for people and, and setting strategy and getting resources for people. Yeah. You know, I, I love that anecdote in the book because um, there's a, there's a point in time at Google when somebody becomes a staff level to decide whether they're going to become a manager or follow the individual contributor track. And it's actually a pretty important fork in the road. And you kind of naturally had to do that because as a founder, uh, you could no longer be building all the things yourself. So you put in place processes, which you know, made it a little harder to you know, make things, things change immediately, but we're there for a reason. We're there to ensure you know, good production code and et cetera, et cetera. Um, that was a journey for you. Do you have advice for others who are maybe at that fork in the road and, and how to think about it? I think that um, I'm going to go way, way off on a rabbit trail here. Um, I have a seven-year-old daughter and for her education, like learning and play and work, they're all the same thing. And I think we forget that as adults. And it is true that like in our work, we are most, we're satisfied and we have fun and we enjoy it when what we're doing is both aligned with our interests and our long-term goals. And so if you work at a company that aligns with your values, if you, um, if the goals of the company align with your goals, then, um, then work is really, really enjoyable. And so I would start with this question, not even advice, but a question, which is who's defining success for you? And just about everyone in our lives will define success for us. Parents, kids, teachers, government, churches, uh, anyone, every, anyone, friends, anyone and everyone will define success for you. They'll have opinions about what it looks like for you to be successful. The only person's opinion that matters is your own. And I, I strongly, this is advice. I strongly advise people to have an explicit and unique uh, so de definition of success. And by unique, I mean, when you, when you tell your friends or your family or whoever, they disagree with you. They're like, that's not success. And you're like, it is for me. Um, and so if you start there, then individual decisions, like whether or not you're going to be a manager or an individual contributor, or you're going to work at one company, or even things like um, when you're trying to understand what the trade-offs are between a relationship or doing something at work, 
and there are trade-offs. It's, it's impossible to live life in a way that like you never have to make trade-offs. Yeah. Being explicit about what success is in your relationships and in your career mm -hmm. and things like that, make that choice not easy. It make the, they make the choice explicit, uh, which is which is the best you can do. It's never easy. Uh, but I think being explicit about what you're trying to get to is 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 really the goal there uh, as opposed to like making it an easy decision. I love that. I want to go back to that in a moment, but I, I you know, coming back to the original question, which is um, going the individual contributor track or the manager track. Um, when, when you went to India, you had to let go of control a little bit, right? Because you were gone visiting um, your wife there who is there on a fellowship. Um, things broke, right? Yeah. Yeah. A lot of stuff broke. And it didn't matter. It didn't matter. Uh, th this is a lesson I learned when I left for six weeks was, um, as we approach our work or our lives, we have to prioritize things. And, and, um, there's a great framework for this, uh, in seven habits, of high, highly effective people where they, where, where the author talks about importance versus urgency and important things are things that align with your goals. Urgent things are typically things that just have to be done now, regardless of whether they're important or not. And one of the key rules of prioritization is to recognize the things that are urgent, but unimportant, to understand the consequences of those things not getting done, and then to let go yeah. and just experience the consequences. Uh, and you find out that the world doesn't end, which is not actually like the same thing as if it's something important, even if it's on, on like, if you don't do the things that are important to your goals, there are, the consequences are much deeper. So, um, and so I got back and like, yeah, like some things broke, like, okay, our website went down for four hours, which was a big deal. Like that was a big deal for sure. But it also taught me, okay, well, I need to put in process in place to make sure that this doesn't happen again. And that it's not relying on me. It, what had happened is my credit card, like I, I had gotten flagged because I was in India. And so the hosting company like charged it and then just turned off our servers, which <laughs> there was a lot of issues with that. There was like our SLAs with our hosting company paying on a net 30 basis. Like there's all sorts of things that we put in place to keep that from happening again. Um, and so I, we experienced, I experienced those consequences. You know, there was another, I did not include this anecdote in the book. There was oh, another oh. time where I tried this, which is um, I went on a camping trip and the system, the online ordering system, um, the original system, we sent faxes to the restaurant and then mm -hmm. we, and then I, I had built a telecom server that would call the restaurant and say, Hey, type in your confirmation code, which by the way, was Twilio. Like I made Twilio on accident before, before Twilio existed. Like, come on, Mike, like, could you just done one of these ideas as like an actual business? But um, I shouldn't complain. Things worked out just fine. But um, so we call the restaurant and ask for a confirmation call. And uh, some bug got released. I went camping. I didn't know it. And there were a couple of restaurants that got several hundred phone calls from the confirmation system just getting spammed with phone calls. <laughs> their, their their phones were locked out the whole weekend and so that was a case where i did not understand what the consequences are and i experienced them anyway and it was not explicit and i got back and i was like oh boy I okay gotta... another anecdote there i love this i'm going to build on this because another thing that really stuck out for me is what to do when you've made a mistake with your customers what did you do after you spam these poor restaurants yeah. hundreds of times during the re weekend to rectify. Yeah, I talk about this in the book because the thing that the thing that allowed Grubhub to really beat all of the competition on the way to the IPO was we were very customer service oriented. Yeah. And a part of that is learning how to make an apology. Mm -hmm. And an apology is not, I'm sorry you feel that way. I, the statement, I'm sorry you feel that way is an attack. It's an accusation. It, you, no one should say that. If you get nothing else out of this talk, just excise that phrase from your vocabulary. It never helps. It doesn't build relationship. It doesn't get you off the hook. Like it doesn't work. An apology starts with, hey, I'm sorry I messed up and let me make this better for you. That's just the first part of an apology. And uh, in Grubhub, what that would mean is if the Thai iced coffee was missing, we would say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that we messed up. Uh, let me refund the different the price of that and also give you a five dollar gift card towards or a ten dollar gift card towards your next towards your next meal. So that's just the make it right in the moment part. The second part, uh, which really is the thing that drives innovation at a company, is the the statement, 
And I'll make sure it never happens again to you or to any other customer. And I'm going to look into what the root cause was and I'm going to fix it. And so as you work through these customer issues that, that inevitably come up mm-hmm. um, and, you, and you make the apology and then you go back and you try and remove the problem before it was a problem, which we did in a variety of ways, just with the Thai iced coffee example, uh, we would send, we would, we knew which restaurants made errors less frequently. And so we, we, um, you may be aware that Google AdWords like has both a price and quality component to it. I did that too. Uh, I copied that from Google. In fact, like I was like, oh, that's a good idea. I should do that. We had a quality component Mm -hmm. to, to the, to the, to the delivery system where the restaurants that had, which we measured by repeat purchase rate. So the, (laughs) consumers, the diners who experienced restaurants that had higher repeat purchase rates would get more orders. Um, and it was a fairly manual process. It wasn't all automated. Um, and so, and so we would actually just reduce the number of errors that happened to restaurants. And then we would also share best practices with our restaurant partners. Wow, very cool. um, and so that like is the full apology. I actually don't remember what I did on the phone, the spam <laughs> phone call thing, but I'm sure I groveled. Like, I'm sure that I was like, so sorry, let me make this right. Um, because I, I remember it being a pretty horrible Monday when I got back to work. Well, most importantly, uh, I'm gonna ask you the question, did you ever spam a bunch of restaurants hundreds of times over a weekend ever again after that moment? No, no, that was it. <laughs> that never happened again. Um, <laughs> yeah, we, I, I mean, that was right as we were entering this culture of unit testing and automated QA testing and things like that, where, uh, and we put specific tests around um, the number, like regardless of any other system, how many calls per minute or per hour or per day our restaurants getting. And, and we would, it would stop the, it would stop the calls. So yeah, we put stuff like that in, in place. Amazing. Well, let's take a quick intermission. Um, the second sort of storyline that's woven into Hangry and why I love the book so much is um, alongside the story of you building Grubhub, uh, you also talked about your uh, trip on a recumbent bicycle across the country. And uh, by the way, everyone who's watching, highly recommend, even if you just read the end of the every chapter, it is so funny, some of the ventures you've been on. So for a qu- quick palate cleanser of a question, um, apparently you like met hundreds of dogs along the way as you rode across the country. Yeah. Like, do you have a dog that you love or a dog that you absolutely hate as a result of meeting hundreds of different kinds of dogs across the country who then proceeded to chase you? Yeah, it was most of the chasing happened in Tennessee and Kentucky when I was oh. off. There's a trail called the Trans American Bike Trail that's um, that's put together and maintained by the Adventure Cycling Association of America. And that was the, the that was the tra- trail I was on. It was it's mostly a collection of roads, but I was off trail because I wanted some solitude for a few days, which turns out is part of the reason that I had so many dogs chasing me. It was really stressful. Um, one caught me and then it licked me and it was, everything was fine. But um, I have a whole section where I talk about like trying to cycle away from the dogs. Uh, at the end of that day, and this anecdote's not in the book, but at the end of that day, I ended up at a bed and breakfast um, called the Federal Grove Bed and Breakfast. It was in Kentucky. And the owners weren't there yet. I had called them and they said, we'll be there this afternoon. And I was in this super chill mode where I was like, I set up my tent. Uh, most of the time, I, this day, I was going to stop at a bed and breakfast because it was a stressful day with the dogs. And there was this beagle that like walked right up to me, flipped over on its back, and I just like scratched a belly. And it was like after being chased by dogs all day and like restored my Aww. faith in canines. It was it was <laughs> so wonderful. Uh, and so I just hung out with that dog for like hours at this random bed Aww. breakfast in Kentucky. Okay, so a beagle. The beagle is your answer. Um, yeah. With that, actually, do you want to just share with everyone a little bit about the American, what is it, um, sci- uh, adventure? The Adventure Cycling Association. Yeah, okay. they... Um, their whole thing is uh, it started in 1976 with the, the bike centennial. There was this Ooh. bike ride across the United States. Um, it typically goes from uh, either east, west, if, it's, if you're going east, west, from Yorktown, Virginia to Florence, Oregon, and uh, goes through the Rockies. And um, this organization just makes sure that all of the towns along the way are bike friendly, makes sure that like services are available, publishes maps. Um, and then they also organize tours for um 
both fully able-bodied and differently able people um, to be able to do not necessarily the super long trip, but um, a variety of trips. Mm-hmm. It's a great organization. Uh, and so, in fact, uh, a portion of the proceeds from the book are actually are benefiting that organization. Um, I'm I'm a huge fan. Uh, now that I have a seven year old, we do the shorter trips. We're not we haven't done a a cross country uh, ninety day trip with a with a seven year old. Uh, but we but long weekends are fun. Mm-hmm. I love that about it. And and um, uh, everyone can right. That was your big message, right? I think you met a lot of people along the way who are like, oh, I really wish I could do that. And you would tell them, you know, you can. And so you can. Yes, you can. Thank it's you. a great yeah. thing to do. I mean, you should, everyone should start a business and also everyone should ride a bike across the United States. These, I firmly believe both of those things. Oh my God. Uh, let's come back to Grubhub for a little bit. It actually ties to your cycling as well. Um, you are not only very, very specific about your personal definition, definition of success, which has helped you make very specific decisions, who your investors are, you know, how long you would stay with Grubhub after the IPO, but also, you know, even um, while you were on the cycling trip, right, you had this definition of success and you also had a definition of like giving up versus quitting. So could you talk a little bit more about like how you go about setting goals, how those change and then like what is the difference between giving up versus quitting and when to quit, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah. So I, I think it's really important, whatever activity we're doing, whether you're riding a bike cross country or working your career, being in a relationship, whatever, I like understanding where you're trying to get to is, is really important. And entrepreneurs need to be good at quitting things because there's this paradox that um, you, you start out with this mentality that like the world is broken in some way. And I can fix it and nobody else can fix it. So I'm going to do it. But then you have to have the humility to listen to your customers, listen to investors, listen to the people who point at your blind spots and adapt. And so the, the arrogance and the humility, they don't play well together. Mm. So uh, that comes into this idea of quitting in the sense that you have to make bold experiments and, and you know that some of them won't work. And it's very, very easy to get caught doing something, say Google Wave for example. Uh, and it turns out nobody wants it, right? Um, and you have to be willing to, you have to be willing to quit the things that that aren't working, that aren't aligned with your goals. And, and you can tell that's the case if your effort's not bringing you closer to where you're trying to get to. But uh, part of that is just being th- this commitment to saying, if it's not working, it doesn't matter how much I've invested in it so far, I want to stop working on it. And I'm going to work on something different. And what that does is it frees you up to make bolder, bolder choices when you know that if it's not working, you're going to stop it. And there's so much stigma associated with stopping something or with quitting, as we call it, that like it's real. And there's so much inertia in the work that we do. It can be really, really hard to do this. And so I make the designation between quitting, which is a good thing, leaving Mm -hmm. the things that aren't working for us and giving up, which is... um, you still are aligned with your goals. It's still working, but like, you're just tired and you don't want to work on it anymore. That's, that's giving up. Like part of this experimental sort of nature of innovation is that you have to work really hard at the things that you're experimenting with. And so you can't, you can't just give up. You have to push through obstacles a lot of times. Uh, And I'm not talking about not choosing not to push through obstacles. I'm talking about being aware about the direction that you're working in and your goals. And so that's the distinction between quitting and giving up. There's a much easier way to think about it, which is if it's late at night and you're tired, you don't want to do it anymore. That's probably giving up and if it's <laughs> in the morning and you're rested and you show up at work and you're excited to work, but you don't want to work on this thing. It might be time to quit that. And so it literally just the, the point of day that you make the decision might be the distinction, distinction between giving up and quitting. So what you're saying is before we decide to quit something, we should order some food from Grubhub so that we're not hangry while we're rage quitting, right? Yeah. Okay. I, yeah. I mean, I saw this on the bike trip too. I mean, I was talking about it in terms of entrepreneurship, but on the bike trip, um, it, at the end of a long day, as I was biking across the US, I'd be like, what am I doing? Like, I'm done with this. I'm tired. I'm hungry. I miss my family. Like, what am I doing? Uh, and then in the mornings, I would say, you know what? I'm just going to go bike for an hour. Yeah. And then at the end of that hour, I'm like, okay, I'll bike for one more hour. And then by like lunchtime, I'm like, this is great. I don't know why I was, it was a problem. But, um, and that's a frequent experience that if we, if we give it another try in the morning, a lot of times, um, a lot of times it just, it's a different result than what you're considering is going to happen at the end of a long day. Yeah. 
Uh, let's talk a little bit about you choosing to leave Grubhub the week after the IPO. Uh, I think that was very deliberate on your part too, and and tying back to this theme of quitting and making that choice. Um, your goals had changed, Grubhub had changed, and you talk a lot about in the book how it was, it, it kind of got away from you a little bit. Um, was that hard? Was that like, how, what was the journey there? Like just, I mean, you had worked on it for a long time. Yeah, it was my baby. Uh, it was very hard. It was very hard to leave. Um, but, you know, we we have like one life right and i have i have 30 at the time i was like i have i have somewhere between a day and 30 years left to work and what do i want my effort and energy to be going towards and uh and i didn't see that that grubhub or the new the new competitors that were showing up um doordash and uber eats i didn't i didn't have the sense that those entities in a public environment public uh, equity environment we're really going to be able to put the independent restaurants first. Right. And uh, it was just, it just wasn't in the cards. And um, I wasn't interested in like in working hard to return shareholders extra cash. I wanted to help independent restaurants. And so as those goals diverged, I decided I was going to go do something else. And I, I often say this, that um, people ask me why I quit. And, and I always respond with, if you're, if you, if, Whatever your career is, you need a reason to stay, not a reason to quit. Like you need a reason to put your effort and energy and life towards a thing. And so, um, and so I left and I went on to spend some time thinking about, well, obviously I rode my bike across the country, but yeah. during that bike ride, I thought a lot about this idea and really where I've, where I've landed is the idea of impact, impact businesses. So businesses are huge levers for social change, whether you want them to be or not. And so that change should be explicit. And I am a proponent of businesses where uh, there's this concept called mission lock, which is um, the impact that you develop in the community, you create in the community from a social perspective and the profit are exactly the same thing. And they, and they can't be divorced. And so the business I started, fixer.com, is um, the idea behind it is that the supply of skilled worker trade tradespeople is insufficient relative to the demand because most of the trade schools have closed. And so instead of like creating a competitor to Thumbtack or Angie's List or Home Advisor or one of those uh, or, or TaskRabbit or one of those companies, I decided I was going to create a company that had a W. Hey, this is startup blasphemy, by the way. I decided I was going to create a company that had W-2 full-time employee workforce with benefits that we trained from scratch. And by doing so, I'd be able to create a better product in mm -hmm. customers' homes and I'd be able to charge a premium for it. And so the mission is to increase the skill and diversity of tradespeople in the communities we serve and to create economic mobility. But the product is a better experience in the home for customers. Mm -hmm. And the two can't be divorced. They're the same thing. And so we're not making trade-offs between profit and purpose. They're the same thing. And that was very intentional in terms of where I chose to put my effort next. Um, it's working. I mean, it's it's working really well. It's a tough business. That was the other part of it, which is it's, a, it's just an operationally challenging business. And I just have an unfair advantage because I have a team that's done it before and I had funds that I could I could finance a large part of it myself. And so I was like, well, that's an even better competitive advantage because nobody else, nobody in their right minds is going to compete with me on this business. It's really ugly. Uh, and that's been the case so far. We haven't had a ton of ton of other sort of copycats show up. Amazing. My favorite quote to sum up this, this sort of shift that you've made is that I think you came to the realization um, of mission lock for, and the sentence was um, the communities benefit, not despite of the profit of the business, but because of it. Right. Yeah. So the profit and the community actually is one of the same. And I thought that was so powerful. Uh, well, you know, um, Let's end with one question because I know we have a few folks who have their own questions to ask. You know, as you sort of journeyed across uh, the United States, you went through all parts of, you know, America that, um, you know, an average person might not see, right, if they were driving or if, if they were on a train. And um, I loved what you said about um, just American restaurants, right? The, in America, you know, the single common thread knitting together the length and breadth of our society is the Greasy Spoon Diner, quote, your quote. Um, I've been thinking a lot about restaurants um, 
It's part of the day-to-day work I do. And, you know, it, we have over 600,000 restaurants in, in the United States and, you know, 14 million people working in this industry. And, and you have such deep respect for these folks. And, you know, this, this entire population and these businesses have gone through so, so much, and yet they define our culture, you know, our locally for all these towns. Um, do you have any sort of closing words for, for them, um, knowing that you spent a good chunk of your life, like working with restaurants, re- restaurants across the country and restaurateurs? I think um, I think one of the things that made me realize how unique our culture here was with restaurants and specifically with with diners uh, was when one of my friends who I made on the bike trip, uh, Terry, he said, you know, what's amazing about the diners here? You can have your eggs any way you want them. Like in England, they just serve you the eggs the way they cook them. Really? But like you can literally say, I want one egg over easy and one egg over medium and they will do it. And they won't even like an eye. And there's something about that, like the heart of service and um, quality and uh, and and uh, connection that happens in that moment. That um, it's really it's really good for our society mm-hmm. in a society that so can be so divisive. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I, I found that the the diners that I went into in town after town they were my touchstone in the sense that like. Every person I was meeting was new for three months and I had just quit my job. And I was like, what am I doing with my life? Like, I have no idea what I'm doing, but I knew I was going to have a great breakfast tomorrow, every single day, uh, which, which was just, it was just amazing. It was one of the things that really made the trip across the U S a joy. Oh, that's beautiful. Um, one last question. I knew, uh, you know, after eating a lot of eggs and um, a lot of, I'm guessing, bacon, uh, you decided not to eat bacon. Yeah. Why is uh, that? There was something about going through small, like just going through rural America and seeing the feedlots and the chicken coops and like the huge industrial chicken sheds and things like that, that by that time I had gotten halfway across the country, I was like, oh, I can't eat meat anymore this is it's just too depressing that didn't keep i i was like three it was like three years i was a vegetarian uh and then one fateful day at a a cubs game in chicago i'd had i'll call it somewhere between one and eight beers and (laughs) uh and someone handed me a thing of chicken wings and that was it i fell all the way off that wagon so uh at the time it was a choice that i made but uh i have since since gone back to eating just about everything I thought so when you recommended your pizza restaurants. I was like, there's no way he's eating just vegetarian pizza, <laughs> given your recommendations. Well, uh, Mike, with that, let's take some questions from the audience. Great. All right. The first one from Ola. Are there ways in which you believe the environment for launching a successful startup company has changed? Um. I think it's changed from a detail perspective, but I think by and large, it's not that different. Uh, it always feels when you're starting a startup, like you're late, you're late to the party. It always feels like everybody else is just, all the good ideas are gone. Everybody else is, is working on the things already and you're behind the eight ball and, and you feel just late. Um, everyone always feels that way. I am sure that when Google was founded, it felt like after, you know, Excite and AOL and Lycos and all those, like, I'm sure that that feeling was there and, uh, it's false. It's false. There's always ideas and there's always a way to innovate. And it turns out the ideas actually aren't even that important. The The important thing is to start. Um, it does take less investment now than it used to. Like you can use, um, you know, cloud-based tech, uh, cloud-based servers instead of like getting, you know, bare metal hardware like I had to. And certainly there's more API-based um, things. Uh, but I actually encourage people to find the places where they're not using all of those pre-made software and and create something that's a little bit more difficult because then you get a head start and a competitive differentiator. Um, So the idea matters in the sense that you should pick a good one, but uh, there's a million of them out there for customer needs that are not met. And there's just as many as there always have been. And there always will be just as many opportunities. I love what you said earlier too. You don't have to be first, but it's important to be the first and the best. And at the end of the day, you know, you're right. Google is like the 45th search engine that was, you know, pitched on Sand Hill Road, right? And so it wasn't necessarily new, but it was a different way of going about things. And I think, you know, 
even when we're feeling behind. Um, a lot of it comes down to persistence, right? And then just building out the market and building up the product. So uh, thank you. Thank you for that answer. Next question. All right, what prompted you to add employment versus independent contractors as a social element of your current company, Fixer.com? Yeah, uh, I think the gig economy is good in a very specific case, which is when people need flexibility and a little bit of extra cash. It is particularly bad for people who do it 40 hours a week um, because as, as a career, as a, as a full-time job. Because while it does, it, while you lose the benefit of flexibility largely, and what you don't have is economic um, economic growth. There's no earning in, earning potential increase as a result of doing that work. If you go work as a grow hub driver, forty hours a week, you do it for three years, you're no better off at the end of it than when you started. And our social contract uh, sort of expects that in work we get economic mobility as we work, that we improve our skills. Um, and so I thought that like that needs to be a part of the model for um, what I'm doing at Fixer. And because we train people from scratch, we picked a W2 model mostly because for two reasons. One, it's better for retention. And two, we can standardize the way work is done so that it creates a better experience in the home. Uh, and so that standard and it's also safer for the workers if the work is standard work is standardized. Uh, and so for those reasons, we picked a W2 model. Very cool. All right. Next question. What inspired you to write your book, Hangry? I have a very specific goal with this book. And it is if I can convince 10 people to think about and think intentionally about the change that they want to exert on the world through the businesses that they create. And they think about that at the start of their business. Mm -hmm. And they wouldn't have if they didn't read the book. Then the book is a success. 10 people. That's all I'm looking for. Like I'm trying to create social change. Also, I wanted to entertain people. Like it's, I, I think it's a pretty funny book. Uh, and so it was fun to write it um, as just from a, from the standpoint of creating a piece of art. It is very funny. Mike is actually yeah. a very funny guy. Uh, it, it, it's a, it's a fast and quick and very insightful read and has inspired me to think about things very differently. Uh, okay, one last question, it looks like. Bring it up. Okay, this is a really good one. I, there's actually an entire book about, uh, you know, What I Wish I Knew When I Were 20 uh, by Tina Selig, who I highly recommend. Uh, if you could go back to your 20-year-old self when you were an MIT engineer, I guess, in sophomore year, what advice do you wish you could have given yourself? Um. I don't, uh, you know, I could have started Grubhub then. I didn't have to wait till I got out of college. I could have written the software three years earlier. And uh, I, I, but I guess what's the point? I guess the other thing I would say to myself is like, go down to that sailing pavilion more and just do more sailing, get worse <laughs> grades. Like the grades aren't going to matter in the end. So, uh, I mean, those are probably, that's probably some pretty flippant answers. But, um, I, but in more seriously, like, just telling myself and my younger self to think more intentionally about where to think bigger, to have bigger goals than paying off my student debt. Um, by the way, 20 year old self would have said to me, okay, boomer, I'm just going to pay off my school debt. You, you go be successful. Your 45 year old self off in the future. You don't remember what it was like to have this crushing <laughs> school debt. So uh, I think my 20 year old self would, would be pretty cranky with my 45 year old self. So he probably wouldn't listen. <laughs> Well, Mike, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you for writing your book. Thank you for uh, sharing with us everything you shared with us today. And it's been an absolute pleasure. And thank you to the Talks at Google team for hosting us. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it.